छह मिनट सेटिंग में मोर में जाओ
Good afternoon. I would like to welcome all the dignitaries on the stage, and we can start the seminar. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Yes, 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 Good afternoon. I request welcome address by Shri A.K. Gupta Ji. We were waiting for you, sir. <laughs> All in the light of waiting. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, on behalf of Institute of Marine Engineers, India, Mumbai branch, and in particular, Navi Mumbai chapter, chapter, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Special welcome to Amit and our senior members of the Institute. The topic is still relevant and very relevant to you all. It's an evergreen topic. I must thank Mr. Kishore Kokar for enlightening us, sharing his wealth of experience on automation with the young marine engineers. Last week, a uh, Vizek branch of Institute of Marine Engineers had organized a seminar in Vizek. We were there, Amit was also there. And the theme of the seminar was artificial intelligence and machine learning. So just keep that in back of your mind. I'll try to justify how, why it is so relevant and such an evergreen topic. When I joined the ship first time, 1976, huh? there was no concept of control room. Forget it. No control room. We used to run up and down, monitoring temperatures, taking soundings, adjusting temperatures. Huh? And near the engine console room, one table was there like this, where you used to write the logbook, and a stool was kept. That was that was all. Then slowly the control room came. But at last, the control room was out of bound for the junior engineer. Junior engineer could enter the control room only to take over watch and in the end to write the logbook. Throughout the watch, she has to be outside. Of course, the senior engineer had some system of pressing an alarm, two alarms, that means Panchu come. Anyway, then came unmanned machinery spaces, UMS operation. We couldn't digest it. It was grilled into us that engine room cannot be left unmanned even in port. Or now ye bolte hai ki sham ko tala laga aur chale jao. So, you see how the technology is evolving. And now we have 
unmanned ships, totally unmanned, remotely controlled. So please appreciate where the technology is going. And on top of that, artificial intelligence. Kisi ne suna hai? Artificial intelligence kya hota hai? Very good, very good. So, computers are programmed and jaise hum log logic lagate hain, reason karte hain, computer will be able to do it. Main engine not starting. So, hum kya karte the? Whether the problem is in the control system, whether the problem is with the air system or the fuel system, we used to troubleshoot. But here, computer is a threat to you, artificial intelligence. He will reason out, he will do everything and he will give you the solution. So this is where the world is going. I hope you will appreciate that this topic is very relevant. And we all young, especially you all, young marine engineers will be benefited from the knowledge of Mr. Kishore Kopkar. With these few words, I would like to conclude. Thank you and Jay. Thank you. I would just like to have give a brief introduction to today's speaker. Mr. Kishore Kopkar, he is a B electrical. He had his radio officer COP. Then he sailed as a radio officer for five years. After that, he did his general class radio communication proficiency certificate from Manchester, UK. Then he's done his radar maintenance and advanced marine electronics courses also from UK. He sailed as an ETO for 30 years, including four years as a superintendent. And finally, he decided to settle ashore as faculty at various colleges, Great Eastern Institute of Maritime Studies at Lonavla, BP Marine at Belapur, where he was conducting the MCA approved high voltage course. Then he was with the Ethiopian Maritime Academy. And right now he is at the Anglo Eastern Maritime Academy at Kazakh, where he is senior faculty. Experience as faculty is about 10 years. And right now, actually, he is starting a new venture. He is starting his own institute called Viking Maritime Training Institute in Belapur. And I think he will tell you himself about this. So, with this, Words I want to introduce Mr. Kishore Kopkar. Thank you very much, Vikramji. All your sir will go down. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Gupta, Mr. Mullah. And it is a great honor to be here. Absolutely. Delighted to be here on this stage. Mr. Vikram Gokhale was very instrumental. And uh, looking at the gathering, a very good afternoon to you and also the two ladies. Uh, without much ado, we should start on automation. Speaking in the same vein of Mr. Gupta's lecture or a speech, automation is the buzzword, and you've got to know automation, the engineers you'll be floundering. You miss any engineer uh, without a good knowledge on automation. You'll be floundering with the today's ships. You'll be floundering since you guys must have worked or you must have an, or had an opportunity to work on the latest modern ships, which I visited. Uh, SCADA systems now, which is which was there in the normal industry for last 15, 20 years, but it's now the advent on the ship. It is coming on the ships. So, Mr. Gupta said we were not allowed to get into the control room. Only the seniors will be sitting in the AC comfort. Rest the juniors will be going around the engine room. But now the things are completely changed. We got to understand and learn that. At, sitting at one place in the control room, you can monitor the whole engine room. All the parameters, the temperature, the levels, the pressures, everything you can monitor. But how? Because the advancement in automation, which has been carried from the industry into the shipping, the normal land industry, into the shipping industry, which is of essence now 
and you've got to read a lot of books. A hell of a lot of books are available in the market on control engineering, automation. You've got to keep pace with the modern world. You, Mr. Gupta very correctly said, it's going to be artificial intelligence now. It's already on. Machine learning is there. IoT is coming on ships too. Internet of Things. And again said, you've got to know. So let's start. What is automation? Uh, I'll take it through. We have got only an hour and a half. In that brief time, I'd like to enlighten you or make you a little bit of aware of what is automation. Specifically, we'll talk of automation on the ships in the marine industry. Where we are going to be specific on that. Uh, what is automation? It's all about having the machine do the work for you, do the maintain the process values as per your desired values, your set points. You as an intelligent person, as an engineer, you're going to say, oh, I want from a boiler water level, this level, that's it. You want temperature 60 degrees Celsius, whatever. And the process will make sure that it is maintained exactly how there is an algorithm to the controller. Coming back to this marine automation, it's a very specific field. You've got to have a hands-on experience automation. What I can insist is, if me, when I was a cub, it was difficult for me to understand how the things work. Studies we have done, but you have to have a hands-on experience when uh, changing the parameters of a controller without knowing we do it. You're going uh, looking at trouble. All right. So let's take uh, a brief view of what is automation uh, in marine industry. Yeah. Now the topics we are going to cover today is introduction to marine automation. Marine automation is what are we looking at when you are, uh, say, for example, fuel oil. You have to maintain a CST. Uh, viscosity of 13 CSE, 30.5 CSE. You've got to maintain the temperature of the fuel, isn't it? Which is as per the records, you want say 125 degrees Celsius. The controller will do everything. And you just sit tight, while you sit down in your engine room and you monitor all your parameters. Simple as that. The second topic will be necessity of automation. Then it is basic fundamentals of automation. What are the basic for what we require in automation? Then comes your controllers, sensors, transmitters, final control elements, application of uh, automation on board chips, and recent developments in your AI, artificial intelligence. That's extremely important for us to understand because uh, for voyage planning, cargo operations, uh, crew changes, it's all going to be automation and artificial intelligence. So let's start now. Why we need marine automation? When uh, Mr. Gupta was talking, even I started my career in 77, 78, uh, there used to be 40 guys on the ship. But now it's written down to maybe 22, 23, or VLCC is 24. How? Oh, all because of thanks to automation. So you have to keep to safeguard our jobs. We got to make sure that we know automation in the back of your hands. Better machine efficiency, when we say better machine efficiency is we drive the machines in such a manner that it works at optimum efficiency. If it's going to be uh, manually operated, you might overdo a machine, overspeed the machine or uh, uh, underachieve the efficiency of the machine which is not done. Automation will make sure you get the best out of a machine. Savings in fuel consumption, of course, now, uh, because, say, for example, you're opening a valve, closing a valve to maintain a temperature steam valve, that is, for the steam uh, coming in, uh, you might overdo, you might underdo, not achieve the right results. It takes long time for a human to come to that result. Less carbon footprint, of course, you're enjoying, uh, or rather, you're employing uh, the automation, so the fuel will be used in op as optimum efficiency. <coughs> Less maintenance, also for carbon footprint is down. Uh, less maintenance of machinery. 
uh, you are not overcooking the machinery, you are using it like an optimum efficiency. So maintenance down time is also down, not required all the time. We can do a condition based maintenance or a planned maintenance, it all depends. There is fatigue for maintenance personnel. Again, coming back to Mr. Gupta's speak, that we should go down the whole day in the engine room. No more. No more, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Pratega, you have all the details. And through IOP, the office will also know what's happening. Continuum temperatures, engine, uh, main engine parameters, auxiliary engine parameters. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is coming from your uh, MSC. They have done an experience about six experiment about six. Sorry. About uh, five, six years back. And uh, the experiment was what? Automation. What they did was they had selected two ships from the fleet, brand new ships, selected during the same voyage. One ship was done with uh, the motors on Star Delta or Potter Transformers. And the second ship, the sister ship was done on VATs. Reviews. And at the end of the year, they found out the consumption on the ship, which was being run by the VUVs, was less by a million dollars, about approximately a million dollars of fuel consumption was down. So they saved a million dollars per ship and even 3,500 ships. That is where we are going to score on automation. So, reduce training for maintenance personnel. They don't have the scanner system. You don't have to run around from this point to that point, uh, bottom deck, middle deck, or the top deck for your engine control room. No, you just sit in one place and do it. Let's go to the next slide now. The basic fundamentals of automation. Now we are doing a hardcore automation system. What we are going to learn is you've got to understand in automation, you need a feedback, isn't it? You've got to, uh, you have to uh, say temperature. We went to the top of temperature. We said we want 60 degrees uh, for cascade and 80 degrees Celsius. How do we know it is really being maintained at 80 degrees Celsius? So we got a sensor, isn't it? Sensors which are giving a feedback to your controller. We have said I want at 80 degrees. So the steam valve will open close to maintain, depending upon the demand of the water, it will maintain 80 degrees specifically. Tight control. Tight control over your parameters, your process variables. Your set point is uh, the personal variable is exactly like your set point. And this is where you, as third engineer, second engineer, the chief engineer, must make, must make sure that you follow all these algorithms of the controller. We have two basic systems for your controller in the automation. One is an open loop system, also known as feed forward system, where the controller will tell the valve open, but it doesn't know what's happened to the temperature. We don't we have to stick to temperature today. Uh, it doesn't know. It's going to be uh, what temperature. It might shoot up to, uh, say, we said uh, the van is open for 15 minutes. The temperature might shoot up to 90 degrees, 100 degrees. Or the valve is now closed and will stay closed for 15 minutes. The temperature might go down. So that's your open loop system. The controller doesn't know what is the effect of the process variation, which is we don't. It's a very fast system. Very fast in form, but we don't use it mostly on the ships. We use only your closed loop system. When you are using the closed loop system, there are three elements which are very important and which are required. One is a controller. I'll just show you that controller part. I have got it for you people to have a look. Now, see, this is there are mainly on ships. We are looking at two types of controllers. One is your electronic controller. This is your electronic controller. This is a microprocessor. It has got maybe IC8051 microprocessor IC. Get it? And this is a small device. This is a P for a uh, proportional integral derivative controller where uh, all the winding is done from the back of here. The, you do the winding. You don't need to bother about the winding only when you're doing troubleshooting or you need to change the controller. What, as an operator, you will be doing is setting the parameters from here. You'll be setting the parameters from here. Please, on a ship, do not change the parameters unless you know what you're doing. Don't touch it. 
if you have to do it at all, read the book manual. It will be given completely the manual. Now, see, this is such a small device, but in your pre-inside room, you must have seen uh, this is have you seen this before? You have seen it. This is a uh, pneumatic controller. This is you have uh, Honeywell, you have Yamataki, you have Nakaki. This is Nakaki, Nakaki Dapon. Nakaki, you have worked on it, isn't it? Have you played with it? Yes. With understanding? Sure. You know, this is a flap and systems. And uh, here, see, have you uh, worked here? Yeah, it should be held like this. Have you worked on it before and opened this any time? Correct and you can achieve the right results. Good. So, this is where your controller has to be, and this is the equipment you work in. You work in them. It's a proper nozzle system, it's a pure pneumatic system. Uh, it gets its input of 20 psi. You have to know the conversation between the psi's, the bars. Uh, this is this one works input 20 psi, output 3 to 15 psi. 14.7 PSA is one bar, isn't it? So, uh, you have to know the conversion 100 kPa, one bar, isn't it? So, you have to know this conversation very well in automation. There are two signals. One is your pneumatic signal, the other one is your electrical signal. And the electrical signal is 4 to 20 milliamps. This one works on 4 to 20 milliamps. This one works on 3 to 15 PSI. And you, as second engineers, must take care, as third engineers, must take care that your pneumatic signal, the air, quality of air, should be clean, cool, and dry. If your quality of your air is not good, you are going to have problems with this. Then we, have you had an experience of uh, water going inside here? To the filter also it goes, and then big picture. All right. So, uh, coming back, one is your controller. The controller gets an input from your sensor, isn't it? I just brought one sensor for you here. Have you seen, worked on this before? Yeah, of course. This is an RT PD100. So, this is an RT, uh, RT, RT PD100. You have a thermocouple looking okay, similar, you have a thermistor. So, uh, you should know how to check it. Uh, anybody has got a guess of what is going to be the uh, resistance at, say, a zero, the speedy 100 at a zero degree Celsius? You have been working at C for a long time, isn't it? And you have been working on it. So, for a PD 100, the temperature, uh, not temperature, sorry, the resistance should be 100 ohms. PD 100, 100 ohms. And at 100 degree Celsius, it should be 138 ohms. So, you should know how to measure it. How to use a temperature calibrator, and this is where your understanding of automation comes into play. Understand that that's very important. So uh, we have to make sure that you know how to check it. If, if your automation is not working, the temperature is not being maintained. You need to have a look. So what are we looking at now? We said we have a controller, isn't it? We want the set point of the process variable should be exactly like 80 degrees Celsius. How do we achieve? We have a controller first, which is getting a feedback from your sensor. A sensor could be, the sensor could be PD RTV, RTV, then it could be levels and then it's the temperature sensors. Temperature sensors are RTVs, thermocouples, thermistors, get it? Level sensors, you have continuous measurement. Your point measurement, isn't it? On your levels, for your boiler water level, or your cascade tank. So, level flow sensors, isn't it? Pressure sensors. So, these are so very important for you to understand. Then, I've got for you to have a look. This is your, this is your I to P converter. That is your current to. Uh, pressure converter. Have you seen this before, isn't it? You have seen it. And this is a very important device which converts a pneumatic signal into your electrical signal. And the electrical signal is 4 to 20 milliamps which goes into your controller. <coughs> this is important. This is a so this is known as a closed loop 
system. So we have a set point which we are telling the controller, I need 80 degrees Celsius. It is getting a feedback from your sensor. Sensor tells the process variable is now 85 degrees Celsius. So the controller will tell the final control element. What is the final control element? Actuator. You must have worked on single acting actuators, pneumatic actuators. You see the actuators, isn't it? Let me give you on the screen. Uh, this is the basic. See, you see that uh, actuator there? And you should see that there is a control valve. See, this is a pneumatic single acting uh, linear actuator with a positioner down there, here, down, and the control. This is a, your ball valve. So you can see here. See, that's it. And so you can, uh, if the automation fails, remember, uh, there's a top mounted handle. Have you seen it before? If the automation fails, you have a handle. You go to manual and you move the handle. But that's not done. That's not automation. That's in case you can't troubleshoot. You have a problem and then you're going to go on working on the top mounted handle. So these are your final control elements. Again, closed loop system. We have a controller, we have a sensor, and we have a final control element. That's your actuator. It could be a sunlight valve. It could be a motor. This and that. And in the sensor, you can have an encoder also, which I should also show you that. Oh, this is the PLC. Have you worked on the PLC before? Have you seen it? Have you working? A programmable logic controller? Of course, any ship which is less than 10 years old will be having it. Now, this is your encoder. For your electronic engines, you have a big encoder. Have you seen it? it sure, you see it. And you have a sharp given encoder. This encoder gives the rotary position. Of your crankshaft. When your crankshaft has moved, you have to fire, you have to uh, get fuel. You need fuel. But how? Before you used to have a governor, a mechanical governor. No, we're all gone. All gone. You've got to keep pace. Huh? So you have an encoder here with a shaft, with a shaft here. You move the shaft is coupled uh, to your crankshaft. This shaft of this encoder is coupled to your. Crank shaft for your uh, main engine. And when it moves, as it moves, this one will move and this will give out, this is an incremental encoder, which will give out a stream of signals, a pulse, pulse per revolution. And this will tell your controller which piston is where. I'm telling you, there's an algorithm which is fed into the computer. So the injection will happen by, look, by the position given back by the Encoder. This is a very small size encoder. You have this big size encoder on the ships. Have you worked, have anybody had a problem with the encoder before? This is a, a bit of a gray area where uh, people get nervous of not to touch the encoder. Now, going forward, See the sensors I spoke about. Sensors are required to acquire the process data and feed the data to the control. Okay, uh, there are two types of uh, data. One is your pneumatic signal, it could be 3 to 15 psi, or it could be 4 to 20 milliamps. Types of sensors temperature, pressure, level, flow, encoders, and proximity sensors. Proximity sensors, I didn't begin. For example, the proximity sensor, you have an incinerator, isn't it? You open the door to the incinerator, you can't find the incinerator. Ash door, loading door, all this today, uh, they have to be encoded. No more limit switches. You must have worked on limit switches, isn't it? Going up and down like that. And no more, no more. It's all, no more contactors, all encoders. I'm sorry, uh, proximity sensors, which gives an NO or a digital signal to your Controller. Everything, all the controllers, say, all that say we have uh, say six uh, doors, 
you have a vacuum switch on your insulator, you have this, that. If all the conditions are met, then this PLC, this is a very unique PLC. If all the conditions are met, the industrial PLC are met with maybe 128 channels. This is only a eight channel PLC, input, eight channel output. So the inputs are given here. And if all the parameters are met, this PLC will generate an output telling to start the accelerator. No more those contactors, old school, uh, the contactors coming in and going out. It will be uh, all uh, digital business. This is all digital business. Anybody has replaced a PLC? Nobody. This PLC is programmed with a logic, ladder logic. We have specifically told the PLC, okay, uh, this, 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 this input should be met, then we are going to get an output from the PLC. Very easy to work on if you know. Extremely easy. This is user friendly. This is very user friendly business. But you have to know. If you don't know, it's Greek and Latin for you. If you know this, very simple. Very easy. Take walk. Until that flow. So we have all this stuff which is coming into the either this controller, this controller, or it's coming into a PLC and the output is generated. Getting it? So, here you have to set the set temperature controller. By the way, this is the temperature controller. The PLC can be used to start, stop any machinery the way we want it. You have told the PLC, all right, uh, get all these things done and then we'll start. Get it? So, this is your PLC that we have it here now. This is your final control element. You must have had problems with this final control element, isn't it? Your actuator. Where is my pointed one? Here we are. See, this is that. Do you know what is this here? This is your position. Today, which, uh, I've been working on the last 10 years. This, this is a smart position. Uh, have you heard of the smart position? The smart position, today, in today's digital world, digitized world, you have this smart position. No more moving parts. No more moving parts. No more electromechanical positions. This is a position where you're working on the piezoelectric effect. This is working purely on the piezoelectric effect. And you have, if you have a problem with it, just leave it alone beyond our scope. To handle it on the ships. You have to replace it for a new one and then you'll be okay. That's the, so this is your the smart this is your smart position over here. What is the positioner? Why do you use the positioner? Because we want the valve, this valve here, uh, this valve here, to open exactly to the desired position as called for by the controller. You get it? So this is very important. You have to know what is the position. This is this is a hardcore automation, and without this knowledge, the thing is. application on board ships, electronic fuel injection for engines. Like uh, we said, uh, we have encoders telling the uh, telling the control, uh, computer or the controller where do we stand, what is the position of your crankshaft, and the fuel will be injected accordingly. Then coming to your electronic, then this is your uh, here the second line electronic devices for auxiliary engines. And we work on and all the new auxiliary generators are fitted with auxiliary uh, with electronic devices. Isn't it? Have you worked on the electronic devices? This electronic governors have got completely, it's completely different way than working with your uh, good work, good work electromechanical governors. This is completely different. So here you got uh, sensors, you have got uh, this um, MCUs, this is your units, magnetic pickup MPUs, rather, magnetic pickup units, which tells the RPM of the engine to your. Uh, controller. 
and this controller now has been told uh, your your you know the group setting and all that, isn't it? So you have said if you want a maximum of five percent group, and then uh, your set RPM says eight uh, nine eighty. Yeah, just give it a thousand RPM, and the governor knows through your uh, magnetic pickup units that this is the present revolution, and it will adjust the fuel electro stepper motor to make sure that exact RPM is achieved for your frequency, for your voltages, get it? So this is your uh, <coughs> temperature level control of various processes. You have various processes, isn't it? Temperature, level, flow, it is all achieved by your controllers. This is a temperature controller. So the PNC, you have different, different controllers there. Mic is not working. It's come out, huh? <laughs> Yeah, so. Thank you. Right. The jacket cooling water, or jacket water cooling for your beliefs, it's working on your gain observation. This is this is a, a difficult topic uh, to be uh, understood. You can't get it still away in this one and a half hour lecture. But jacket cooling motor, and this is done by again your PID controller. There are two controllers in cascade, master and slave, and very fine effect, very fine control over your temperature for your jacket cooling motor. You have Two controllers doing the same thing. So once you get to know this automation business, it will be very easy for you to go there. Without having a having a brief knowledge is really not done. You have to have very intimate knowledge about your automation there. You know, then your boiler feed water level control using three element control. Boiler feed water, you must have had problems. If you have problems, you are really worried, isn't it? As a third engineer, you are in charge of the boiler, you are worried. Now what I'm going to do? Your water level is not being maintained. Your pump is bad. Your motor, your feed pump is gone bad. Your motor, but the level is not there. You are getting all the alarms all the time. So you've got, again, controller, sensor, temperature of level sensor, and the final control element, this one. Discotherm, you guys uh, have been working on uh, the capillary type discotherms, isn't it? The capillary discotherms, but now, last seven years, we have got the electronic discotherm, which is much more accurate, much, much more accurate, with an electronic sensor, which is giving, giving a feedback to your controller that this is the viscosity, this is the temperature, and the controller is telling the final control element to open close your steel valve to maintain the viscosity. The Again, the important aspect there. Then the boiler air fuel ratio. You want less smoke, isn't it? You have clean, um, you have burnt air coming out through. Again, you have a automation business with a ratio controller. With a ratio controller, again, you have this. You got to make sure that you know how to how to set up the controller. This is an art. Setting up a controller is an art. You just can't go the gear, the gear, the tell you, tell you. No, it's a it's a basic thorough uh, knowledge is required when you are doing a controller setup. Thorough knowledge is required. Now, this is more important and very interesting coming to the uh, recent developments in shipping industry. Use of, now I said, we are like you going on primary ships, prime, new ships, not we all other which have made this about two years back. You are having this SCADA system. 
you have heard of SCADA, isn't it? SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. You have smart transmitters. Now, this one is a passive sensor, a very passive sensor. It, it is just going to give a, a 420 amp signal to your controller. But with the smart transmitter, you are going to have an additional information being given to the system. That means I'm healthy or I'm bad. Am I working correctly? These are all digital signals coming in. This is a smart positioner. This is known as hard terminal. This is known as the hard technology. HARP stands for heavy addressable remote transducer. Heavy addressable remote transducer. This is also known as the sensors are also known as smart sensors. So it doesn't give only the process uh, variable what's happening in the process. It's also telling, it's doing self-diagnostic. Both your work on ships where the sensor uh, is gone bad. It's going to tell the controller bad. So you say it's in a screen, sensor problem. You get that. You just know that it's a sensor problem. You just go and change the sensor, that's done. Set it up again, and that's done. This is the new age automation. This is your new age automation where you have to learn all this. So the SCADA system is such, you have so many hundreds of sensors, hundreds of controllers, not hundreds, 10, 20 on ships, on land, yes. 10, 20 controllers, they're all talking to a central computer. It's talking to the computer, and the computer now is telling you what is the state of health of all the controllers, sensors. So it's a one point uh, decision making. You sit on a chair and you see all the parameters of what's happening. This is now in your shipping industry. Modbus, the, my third is your Modbus, third point. This is the Modcon, this is done by the Schneider. Schneider, you must have heard the company, they have developed it. This is a system for the SADA. Which is working on a modular sensitive. So all you are you have is your uh, sensors, your controllers, your final controller, all talking to each other and talking to your computer. Then your RTUs, RTUs, uh, these are remote terminal units, smart sensors. Again, they are the ones telling your computer what is the health of your system. Now coming much forward, even this is now being phased out. This PLC is also being phased out. You are coming with MEMS, micro electromechanical systems. Okay, everything is getting miniaturized, miniaturized, miniaturized. Are you getting it? And so, like we old in school, we had we used to do all everything manually. Then came slowly automation where you had small controllers, PLCs coming up, up, up. Now you are getting into any of this business also. That is micro electromechanical systems. That is the one which is, it's going to be there. Next 10 years, there's going to be a sea of key or other sea change in the things, how the ships are. Your machinery finally will be the same. But controlling the machinery, the process of controlling the machinery will be all advanced now. Now, this is your artificial intelligence in ships. That is the new age again. The artificial, like for example, you know, what is the best example you know of? You, we, you, we, we all use artificial intelligence in the daily life. Every day we use, when, for example, you're driving a car or a motorbike, or you want to go from point A to point B. We just punch it, it's a little, so the Google map. The Google map. Now, we'll look into all the traffic in the area. Take a decision. It knows there are 10 roads going into that point, And it will see the traffic from all the roads 
and tell you take this route. That is the best route. How it is done? It is done by your artificial intelligence, isn't it? That is now on the ship where, for example, your voice planning. Say, for example, you are going from Mumbai to say Muscat. What you do is you just plan the passage, isn't it? But no more now. Uh, you tell the uh, artificial intelligence to do it for you. It will take into account the sea conditions, the wind speeds, the currents, and it will itself tell the engine. You have told the engine you want maximum RPM, so much, so much, everything. You want your fuel consumption at that point, and it will ensure the artificial intelligence will ensure that your engine runs at the optimum speed. Remember, we did that in the initial thing. So it runs at the optimum speed and you get the best fuel efficiency. This is where your artificial intelligence is already there. It's already done. Cargo loading and discharge operations. Say for example, container ships, it, will, it knows what are the, it is a way of prediction for over six months also. It knows, say you're coming to Mumbai port, it knows in real time, what are the problems faced there? How to do the loading or how to do the discharge of containers? And it will tell the chief officer this is the way you will go. So, human intervention is going to be very least, nothing left for chance. Nothing left for chance now. It's all going to be pre planned, and you go as per that plan and you do it. All it carry for crew changes. It knows. The airfares going from, uh, say, uh, Mumbai to Singapore, it will tell, no, no, don't do the changes here, do the change at that point. Do the, uh, it knows X, Mr. X, Chief Officer, is staying there. You know, always right in the uh, computer. And it will tell you when, which port to discharge him in this time. So, all this is coming up now. For example, uh, they are trying to find out what you see. They are, when you go to US, you go up, isn't it? The Indians go to US and they all go up. But now they are trying to have robots which are programmed to move in the engine room. Maybe two robots on the bottom deck, bottom platform. These robots will be programmed such that they'll go around, end of the round, they'll come back, they'll go, they'll, it will keep going for the whole night. It will be free for the whole night. And this will help to, in case of an emergency, it can, uh, it is like, um, what do you call it? We have fine sensors, isn't it? We have smoke detectors, we have heat detectors, we have, we have a little bit flame detectors. So before this can react, they are poking the nose everywhere, the robots. And they'll be moving round and round in the engine room, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth the whole night. Not getting tired, you have that. So that is the buzzword now coming to your automation and control engineering. There are a number of uh, uh, reasons for having the control over a uh, good tight control over your process. You save fuel, is it? You save sailing time. All of this matters a lot from the owner's perspective. He's more keen on saving the money, isn't it? The owner, he wants to make more and more and more money. And this is the control engineering coming up. And believe me, with the advent of artificial intelligence and all this going hand in hand, there will be reduction in manpower. The IMO has already made a decision, they have come out with a circular that. Uh, Minimum this much manpower has to be kept, even though you have artificial intelligence on the ships. You must have heard of remote controlled ships, isn't it? Remotely controlled from the land. So, where do you stand there? Isn't it? It's a very scary position. But the IMO has said that this much minimum manpower has to be there. What will happen is the best of you will be getting jobs, isn't it? The people who know of your artificial intelligence, your control engineering, automation, they are the ones to be chosen by the company.
Now, coming here uh, now another half an hour, I'd like to take questions from you. The very important is we like to have an interaction. This is one way traffic we did. So how can we now uh, please come up with questions, you see? And uh, anybody with a question now? Any questions? You got to ask questions. So you know, we can be more uh, elaborate. So if somebody wants to start learning about it now, how can one go about it? Thank you. So if somebody wants to start learning about it now, how can one go about it? Uh, yes, uh, start learning what? Automation? Control engineering. Control engineering. Now, uh, see, we have uh, today's uh, the class uh, for the second, second and the class one combined is on control also. But you have to attend. Now, I'm not coming my history uh, because starting now, coming to me. Uh, you have to do these courses. You have to do these courses. You have to spend some money. Your, maybe your company sponsors you to any issue. There are uh, one or two in UK also. They will sponsor you or you do it on your own. That is the best way. Because, uh, you know, for example, for example, what we have asked is a PID controller. This is a PID controller. You did the P. The proportional. What is the proportional action? The P. The proportional action is the action based on the error. You have set your set point at 80 degrees Celsius. But the process is now at 35 degrees Celsius. So the uh, your uh, water, say for example, has to be heated. So your steam valve needs to be opened. But how do you go about it? For that, you have to have a hands on ex hands on experience. But if you go on the ship and start doing it, you will not be able to handle it correctly. You do something, finally you achieve something, but at a tremendous loss, you might spoil this, you might uh, uh, damage the control. It's a very expensive control. This Nakakita costs about eight thousand to nine thousand dollars, US dollars. So if you open the cover, it's very easy to open the cover and put a screwdriver and damage it. So uh, the answer to your question will be to do some first. You have to uh, do something. You have to learn from people who know this stuff. And you have to do it very fast. That's important. Any other questions, please, coming up? Can you elaborate a little bit more on NEMS? Yes. The micro electromechanical system. This one. Has got all the what I spoke about three elements uh, sensor, <laughs> controller, final, it's all in it. It's all in it. Say, for example, uh, gyroscope. You have a gyro watch, you have a gyro in your uh, watch. You can know the position, isn't it? You can know the uh, you can know the north, south, the direction. That is uh, MEMS. So the MEMS has got all the things incorporated in one chip and is a microprocessor chip. It's, it's in your cell phones, in your cell phones, you have any other system. You, you can, uh, you know, you flip your phone, the picture will go around this way, that way. So, okay. Anybody else, please? So we still have lots of time to just speak something now. Don't, don't think, you know, you must open up and there should be good interaction. And we should, anybody wants to ask more? Just wanted some elaboration on the what this PLC which is connected to the IoT. So how is it going to change? Yeah. Yes. Uh, now Internet of Things. So uh, what happens is you have to have a gateway. For that you need a gateway, a switch, a router. So this gateway will tell the internet. Through the internet, we get a command again through a gateway, and then it will be told to the PLC to this business. And PLC has to be programmed for all these gateways. Very the gateway is very important for your IoT. So this uh, you have heard of internet of things. 
So far, the problem is going to get that signal from the ship to the cloud. Okay. Now, today, if you're uh, getting from the ship to the cloud, you have satellites. You have uh, dedicated satellites for internet. You have dedicated satellites. So this, are a, this is a solution. Basically, for example, I think Android is using the Starlink. Starlink, yes. yes. They are using the Starlink. These are the low Earth orbit. Yes, these are low uh, so How orbit. is the technology different from the conventional? From the? From the conventional satellite. Uh, okay, the, the, the conventional satellites are two types. One is your one is geostationary satellites, and one is your orbiting satellites. So here, because the uh, altitude of the satellites, the starlink, the internet satellites is much lower, you require a very small signal, strength of signal, and you have got hundreds and hundreds of satellites. Orbiting satellites. These are not geostationary satellites. They are orbiting satellites, and one of the satellites will always be in touch with the equipment dumps. That is the way. You will not. Uh, in the, uh, I am told that there are about 500 uh, satellites from one. Uh, this one, other than Leon Musk, PE or whatever, he has got about five six hundred satellites. How much? Seven thousand five hundred. Oh, yeah, so more than 7,000 satellites. Exactly. Satellite. He's got so uh, he is controlling now, he's controlling the show. So, once this data goes on to the cloud, then you could as well use AI for changing the program on the PLC. Yes, you can you use it. On board. Yes, 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 that is coming. I don't want to scare you, but it's coming. If you read, uh, the guys sitting in your office can say, okay, change this parameter, they can do it. Instead of telling the chief engineer to go down to the chief engineer, they can sit in the office and do it themselves. It's happening. It, it's happening. It's scary for the uh, person, but the, that is the way it is. Now, the satellites are big. And every every country is launching satellites, satellites, satellites. So there's be a uh, traffic jam. There could be collisions of the satellite, but no, they are really from each other. I mean, and that's perfect. I think it's not a question, just a comment. Yes. Traditionally, when we were sailing, they were both from those usual woodward governments. Yes, yes. And now with the electronic governance, I suppose the woodward governors were more robust. And here the troubleshooting or to attend them is very difficult. We got to call a service engineer, which is very expensive. Uh, settings and settings of the RPM convert to the and engine room and bridge RPM doesn't coincide. So somehow uh, it's it's not that reliable. Uh, not that reliable. Governor, once you own all the fighters or people are not doing your oil change and all, what about governor never gave us problem? This electronic governor problems are quite frequent. This, this, is, is, yeah. this is my observation. <laughs> it's just a comment. Yeah, it's coming up. They are, they are now troubleshooting. They know that this governor. Now, a bachelor from uh, Sweden, uh, they have been good governors now. They are from the government of class. We have good in all practices. Pardon? Praxis. Praxis. About uh, electronic about. Uh -huh. Maker. Yeah, what is the maker name? Praxis. No. Uh, bachelor. No. Praxis is also one. Yeah. Praxis. Okay. Uh, Praxis, they have complete set of automation also for the ships. Okay. Who is the governor like yours? No, just governor. They have worked on the bachelor, then Woodward, and then the uh, Kayot. They also go to Kayot, Japanese one. And, uh, they have handled their bonus also good. The whole problem is the PID, uh, electronic governor is, is a PID controller. It's a PID controller. And the third engineer is, uh, just a few days back, I was doing a clear uh, uh, certificate for ETO. He said, the, the third engineer was going away, he set a wrong parameter uh, in your electronic governor. For all the three, they are different. And they used to have frequent blackouts. So what I'm saying is correct. Because if you uh, don't set the P and the I in all the 
government is equal, correct, it's not going to happen. You are going to end up having problems. But the best part of your electronic government is the smoke suppression. You know the smoke suppression? The smoke suppression is a function of an electronic government where the fuel is ejected. You have, you're having an inertia, isn't it? The engine should start. So the full fuel will not be ejected. The fuel will be ejected only for the engine, for the spinning, the, uh, the, the IC engine starts firing, the speed picks up, and then more and more fuel will be added. So the end result is smoke suppression. And then there is another factor to it. When you are idling your generator, you need not run the generator at full speed. You can set the parameters in your controller, okay, run it at half the speed. So you are basically you're saving so much of fuel for the company and it will be appreciated by the owners, isn't it? So that is very important. These are the two main factors of your electronic parameters. Yes, yeah, here's the question please. Sir, uh, sir, I recently got to work on the smart positioner you just mentioned about. Okay. So this system was incorporated into the IG system. Now the problem with this system is all the system, all the components are uh, dependent on each other. So for example, we have got like five volts in IG system, out of which one of the smart positioner is not working. And the whole system goes for a toss. Okay. And that's where the problem comes in for the owners and the ship builders. That they have to invest in a lot of money for one smart positioner to keep the whole automation running. And then we are like, what should we do now? Because these smart positions are very, very tricky. You can't work on it. It's uh -huh. gone and you have to replace it. Now, until the spare parts arrive, you have to run the whole system on manual. Like you have to start working and start operating all the, you basically have to remove the automation and start working by hand. Because you are not getting feedback from that work particular position. So what's your take on that? Uh, because again, the reliability is no more. Of the system. Because we are working into automation. And now once automation gives up, then we have to go back to the system. Just one part of the automation, not the entire system. Then we manually have to pull out all the walls, make it manual and start. Okay. So what's your take on it? Yeah. Uh, this was for your IG system? Correct, sir. Uh, so now, for example, uh, you, are, um, you have an uptake valve from the boiler, the, coming, the flue coming in, uh, your scrubbers and this and that. Then uh, the, uh, the pressure, uh, IG, uh, uh, oxygen temperature less than 5%, all the valves uh, manipulating. Is it uh, to, uh, to atmosphere going to the tanks? So in your modulation, this modulation has failed in your case. That's what I think. And why this thing? Because the controls are working fine. So all are working fine except one, the one which is uh, the one which used to go to tank. That has to control the flow in the entire system once the oxygen temperature is reached. Now this system is not giving data to the entire system. Once the system is working, okay, it's saying now I've got the oxygen content. Let's open the oxygen. Now they are trying to open the wall, the wall is not opening. When the system is saying open the wall, it is not opening, there is too much of back pressure, the system trips. Now what we need to do that, we need to go back, remove all the wall, and now start operating. Uh, operating manually. Yeah. So, so again, just because of one wall, one wall which is not working at the end. Absolutely. Now, this is a, a catch and beautiful situation. Then you do this, this one goes back, this one you do this, that one goes back. So what? This gentleman had said, you have to know how to practice this problem. You have to know. Uh, the basic idea will be if you identify that is the positioner which is bad, you have identified that? Yes, they have identified that the positioner is not working. We ask for a replacement. Now again, the turnaround time is very high, three months, because we are not doing frequent codes. Uh -huh. So again, the whole point is that on a ship, uh, either you need to have that amount of stairs available mm -hmm. to keep it running in automated mode, or else you have to go back to that. That's, uh, that's a problem. My suggestion, my take will ask clearly what is your take? You have to have adequate specs. You have, uh, normally they will keep uh, one or two smart positioner as a spec. Because if the smart position goes back, you just cannot repair it. You cannot. Because there are small piezo uh, cells in it, which are going on and off, on and off to open close the air. And uh, as for the 4 to 20 milliamps signal coming in, it will open. It will, it's a bent piezo, a bent uh, piezo inside. So it will keep bending to allow the air to go and allow the van to open a close. Because then you are sitting down. You cannot do nothing. You have to replace. And uh, um, your bandwagon was you didn't have a spare. 
So we had one, but then we had to replace it for one more one, which was like three months ago. So no, the turnaround time is only that you have to still wait and then perform on the so your automation was down for your IT. Absolutely. So that's that's a problem. So again, the question is about the reliability of the automation that you uh, now coming basically you got to understand, like in your case, you understood that there is a position which is bad, which is a damn good thing. Because most of the people don't know where the problem is. The problem is in a controller. Or this is the position uh, valve or the actuator, or the diaphragm is uh, broken. If you don't know, you have to have that understanding, you know, that acumen to understand where the problem is. Well, that's a good thing. You could understand that the position is bad. And what you must do is uh, to find out if your position is good or bad. You give a 4 to 20 milliamp signal through your loop calibrator. You had that? So we did that. We did the exact same thing with the loop calibrator. And we saw the uh, motion of the valve is opening the without the position. So it was operating fine. The position was not responding to it. So that was the problem. So we figured out that the problem with the position, but we did not have a spare position. So what we did, we removed one of the position from the other unit and put it here because this was more critical work for the tech. And we exchanged with the one which was in the engine which we couldn't manually control. Uh, only what your point is very valid. Only what you take care of is the bench. Pressure for the actuator. If uh, this uh, bench pressure for the actuator is say uh, one to four bar, fully open, fully closed, and this, what is this position doing here to watch out? Uh, if they should match, that otherwise it will not be able to open close the valve. Uh, the actuator will not be able to work properly. But it worked correctly in your way. Uh, so we check the setting. It was same for both. So we saw. So that is your bench uh, setting. Huh? Um, uh, every actuator, from the screen, every actuator has got a pressure fully open, uh, maybe if you say air to open, air to open phase close. So it will be fully open, say four bar. Uh, your position should give that much air for it to fully open. Right? But then uh, only uh, my uh, suggestion could be you have to have spent. That's it. Right, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, any more questions, please? Yes. Uh, some of these are coming from our viewers online. Do these smart sensors have remote diagnostic And another question was is it possible to carry out, carry out the calibration from remote? Yes. Uh, the smart positioners, uh, the smart positioners, the RTUs, remote terminal units, they have a basic 4 to 20 milliamp signals going into your controller. On top of that, by means of frequency shift keying, it will load a digital signal, a digital signal which will tell the controller whether this position, whether the sensor is good or bad. I'm good or it will be self-diagnostic. It will be self-diagnostic, and it, you can find out from the screen that the sensor is, for example, in your car today, it will tell you your tire pressure is uh, low. It's the same thing. It's a smart sensor. It is telling, oh, your pressure is low. Pressure is low. Please fill in the air. Thank you. One more question is, Mr. Janaka, uh, what is the purpose of the quadrature sensor in the angle input? Yes. Quadrature sensor has got basically two outputs A and B, A and B, and one more third is your Z, C. See, the quadrature sensor, if this quadrature, two outputs which are in quadrature, that is, they are out by 90 degrees. If A output is leaving the B output by 90 degrees, that means the uh, encoder is moving clockwise. If it is if the B output, the top of the right here, it's here. Here, this is that quadrature encoder. Incremental encoder is known as quadrature encoder also. So the, there are outputs here, three outputs coming here A, B, and Z. A and B are your uh, telling whether this encoder is moving in, uh, the sharp is moving in clockwise or anti-clockwise direction and then the Z phase coming out. So every revolution it gives a pulse. 
That means one revolution is complete. Thank you. Uh, another question is what is this connected shift concept? Connected shift. We have connected cars over here. Oh, he's talking, oh, he's talking that. Yeah. Ah. So again, coming back to your cloud and IoTs, coming back to that. So uh, all the information is being fed onto the cloud and is accessed by your company and the company can do changes in your parameters of your machinery, which is again maybe dangerous or it's fruitful. So not only that, I would say I can this connected ship will cater to the maker and they oh he's talking about that too. Uh -huh. So they can give the feedback to so this parent, please check with this, uh, these parameters are not right or some diagnostic is required. Yes. Well, this is the, the, what we have, this is uh, Anglo-Eastern, where uh, Starlink, you know, the makers, they keep getting, they are monitoring. Say, for example, uh, one person in a company has got 100 ships, he's monitoring 100 ships. He is monitoring 100 ships, and then he knows, every ship, the parameter is going to be Yeah. What is that you say? The maker, I mean, uh, the running engine, if the parameters, if, if the ship is connected, the data is being trans uh, transmitted to the maker for analysis. They will revert some things here, which we don't know. They are within the range, but uh, not the I mean, unknown range. Is it a uh, so they may say yeah. a pre warning, like, uh, okay, this is going to be wrong to say this. Is that this is only a fact. Now, but the trouble is, still, it's not very prevalent. It's very few, it's not very, very prevalent. It is coming up. It's going to be there full blown after maybe 10 years. No, on uh, ship, uh, I said uh, you should get a monthly feedback reports of uh, analysis of this data going out. Okay. And, and maybe, your, maybe, 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 okay, maybe. Okay, so they used to say, okay, this month uh, I see performance, uh, okay, for some running hours or some, on some date uh, it was not right. Okay, so what went on? Then there used to be questions from the company. Why you did check? Okay. This is a good way though, because behind uh, on, uh, this PC, uh, PLC, what is happening, we don't know. And, and you are so occupied with other jobs also, you are paying least attention, and when there is no alarm, that means you don't work up. It's within the parameter. But they are checking, yes. Uh, Varsila is doing that. Uh, yeah. Varsila is doing that. And they are monitoring, yeah, very correct, they are doing it. Yes, uh, yeah. uh, one other question is from somebody else. He says, what is a machine automation control? Uh, that is a different word. Machine automation control. Yeah. Uh, can you give a question? Mac. Mac. Yeah. Mac. Yeah. Mac. Yeah. Mac. Yeah. Mac. Yeah. Mac. So, <coughs> I think that is where the traditional PLC functions are being augmented by AI. Uh, you mean, uh, now, uh, they are not, uh, of, uh, the AI is being used as a trial basis as of now. Yeah, it's on a trial basis. So they are not playing the machinery parameters. So uh, this Mac system is uh, have not been told or are not read that it is being used uh, specifically on any ships. Have you seen anybody uh, Mac being used? Because it's purely a trial basis. It's purely a trial basis. That uh, remotely. Huh? Uh, Think something? Uh, any other questions coming up? Because uh, again, uh, the automation is reaching that level that it is beyond the fragile capacity of uh, engineer now. This Mac, the engine room, the, 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 the uh, companies checking the parameters, connective ships. It is happening. It will evolve. It is, it's in a nascent stage as of now. It will evolve, but it will take some time. Yeah. It, will, it, will, it will take some time. It will take some time. And uh, as of now, you have this encoders and all this business, you have provisions, which is their ships. Which is their ships. I would uh, just like to add, uh, earlier we used to write a log book and that data used to be there and that, that log book after the month end is towards the cold store book. Correct? I want to 
would call this cold stone because nobody goes back and checks it. That's why I call this cold stone. And we have no place to send new reports. Yeah, and then slowly we started gathering that data, gathering that data. And then uh, the idea came out why not to analyze that data? No. So slowly people started, let's get the data. So because one port, there is a limited capacity to analyze that data. You need to have good servers, you know, we need to have a very good uh, capacity where uh, you can say servers or processors to analyze that data and track that data. That is how that uh, concept of smart shift came. Let's get that, that data assured because now we have very good connectivity and very cheap connectivity. So all that data is coming ashore and they have very huge servers. So they are able to store that data I mean, every every minute or every I think five minutes that data is coming. And now with the servers and this uh, AI, now we are able to track any deviation what is happening. Let's say your exhaust temperature was 330 degrees when you were uh, in Japan and suddenly you come to Singapore and your exhaust temperature goes to 360. It is not surprising because your yeah, outside temperatures are gone up. So it should not raise an alarm. Okay. So that AI can do that because it is tracking that data and it is comparing it with your seawater temperature with your ambient temperature. But say you are still seeing you're going from uh, Japan to US for uh, you are doing this uh, <coughs> Arctic route or whatever, and then your temperature still goes up from 330, 360 degrees, it is still not an alarm, but it should raise an alarm. So the ambient temperatures haven't changed, the ambient conditions have not changed, but still there is a deviation. Getting my point? So with this AI and with this big data analysis, now, now we are able to track that deviation, that no, no, none of the ambient conditions have changed, but the result parameter has changed. So that will trigger an alarm and that will tell you that there is some problem we need to look at it. So this is how things are going to go in the future. Slowly all the makers are getting connected. And because the makers, they have in-depth knowledge and they know exactly how their machine is going to behave. They are giving you what they are giving manually is very limited. But the kind of information that the maker has about that machine behavior is a lot more. I mean, it's you can say 100 times more than what is written in the manual. So now, slowly, in future, you will find that they are connecting every machinery to the maker. And the maker will tell you suddenly he sees a uh, different behavior from his machine. You will immediately tell you. The good and bad part is... Videos, they are putting software on ships. Which is monitoring all these parameters. Yeah. They put the software on the ship, but because of the data protection policies, that software will have limited capacity or it will be highly protected. No, it will be highly protected. Yeah. So, good and bad part. Good part is it can tell you in advance of any machinery failure. It will tell you before the machine fails. The good part. Bad part is. Now all the monitoring is done by the machine, so less number of people required on board. That is the bad part. Okay. So but now coming to you know, this basic thing, uh, I was reading an article with Marcella that they don't want you to take it with the settings. They will tell you what to do. Because they are very scared that you might spoil their reputation. You might tell the uh, world that this is not a good agent. So they don't want you to mess up with this uh, system. You will be waiting for them to answer. Okay, do this, like very correctly said. And now the situation is come uh, where you have a server on ship. The server is connected on the SCADA system and the real-time information is sent to the maker that this is happening on a ship. So where do we engineers stand? That is an important thing. That is an important thing, isn't it? So, uh, the company is telling you what to do and what not to do. In that is my work on one of the skills. Uh, Napkin, we are not allowed to work. So there's a limit to it. Can I work? Yes. So I work on one of the ships. Uh, 
it works like as it seems. The gas part for the vehicle system was a bit voltage. So if we have any issue, they lock the system down. That you can't proceed beyond this point. This is your limitation. After this, you drop a bit to the WhatsApp system and they would guide us over the email or phone call. And they would take control directly there and then uh, do the troubleshoot. And the same was with ABB for the frequency types. They did the exact same thing. For all the pumps which are having the VFDs, they have a direct control. Beyond one point, we cannot work. Even if the GPO wants to work, he cannot work because the rights are very the big case. So that's how it is happening on the network. So VFDs, coming to the VFD the fundamentals, the big VFDs, which are driving, say, 100 kilowatt motors and up, you are not allowed to change the parameters. That's, that's correct. So ADB, uh, the all the VFDs are stuck, we don't touch it, don't touch it, we take controls and we solve the problem. Within a matter of few seconds, the problem is solved, and the system is back to normal. But we don't know what the problem was exactly. And they don't tell you also. Yeah, they don't tell you. They don't tell you. For onboard team, there are no upskill or in-skill That is a big question. That is a big question. On the job. So, you know, the basic way to understand this, say VOP, just say to VOP. The VOP has been so designed. It's a user-friendly VOP. You have to only adjust what speed uh, ranges, the frequencies. Say, for example, you say you are 60 hertz. You say, okay, my lowest frequency is 5 hertz, but most frequency is 60 hertz. Few parameters you are able to change. That's it. You are that now. Then they'll send you on the internet the information. You take it on your dongle or you connect directly to the VOP and you change. That's all you do. Then uh, the VOP starts working. You know, double shoot. Perfect. That's what we do. So you have to take a dongle or a pen drive and change it and then reboot and that stuff. For your boilers also, for your boiler, uh, the boilers are so very sophisticated, isn't it? But the firing sequence and everything is so sophisticated. Something goes wrong, uh, you have to ask this question. How do you, there was a question to him, the PFC business. Now then the glitch in your PFC, you are not allowed, you don't, you can't access the software. You can't. You don't know the passwords. So uh, tell them, they'll send you the, again, uh, patch on your, this one, internet, you download it, put it again on your computer, done. Well, the problem solved problem solved out. The problem solved out. That's, that's simple. But for that, you have to have the basic knowledge what to do. So what are the PSCs doing, what they're not doing. And uh, again, for the PSCs, the power supply is very, very critical. Very, very critical. If the PLC uh, loses its power very often, you are going to destroy the PLC, the program I could not get control. Are we finished the time now? Everyone is waiting to go home again. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. I would like to call on Mr. Gupta Ji or Mr. Tariq to hand over the memento to the speaker. Yeah. <laughs> It was a good session, and I hope and I expect that you have understood things. And there is an emphasis on you to learn. Don't get left behind on the ships. I'm going to uh, very short. Very short, yeah. Uh, this Viking money guy thing is and it is started. The first bachelor starts from May, and it is a there are two courses. One is an advanced, all this equipment much better than this is also from there. Uh, we have it actuators. You'll be tuning the actuators, you'll be tuning the position, the spot positioner. If you have a problem, we have a smart position. I'll show you what to do in case there's a problem. 
then uh, we are going to learn about the PNC programming. We are going to do a little bit about your computer networking. You guys, you want to ship, you don't know what is the star topology, RJ45. Uh, Today, the only thing that comes to isn't it? You have to know by how to use a trimming tool, how to check those basic things. Uh, we'll be having we'll be having all temperature sensors, pressure sensors, I to P P to I conversions, all on. So it is a data board, TPD data board, very near to GP Marie, or some facility in the day, and you're all welcome. You're all welcome. So you can start enrolling for the next month. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, call Tariq to give us the vote of things. Yeah. What a wonderful session we had, you know, on automation. I mean, just to recap, we started from the human controllers uh, in the early 70s and 80s. And then from human controls, we we went to uh, pneumatic controllers. From pneumatic controllers, we went to electrical controllers. And if you see the size from human controllers, the size came down to pneumatic controllers, which is there in front. And then from there, we went to electrical controllers, which are even smaller. And then from electrical controllers, we went to electronic controllers, which are solid shape basically solid state controllers, which are very miniature in sizes. So we, we have seen that graduation, which was very wonderful. And then we, we it, it was demonstrated on also in front of us. And uh, one thing I would like to add is from the, if you see the uh, uh, this pneumatic and electrical controllers, they always had limited parameters to play around with limited parameters that we could set in like p i d but with the solid state controllers uh, with the electronic controllers there are so many parameters if you just go into the digital screen there will be about 50 parameters that we can set in so the kind of playing that we can do with that controller is immense and that is where the world is going i mean there are so many checks and balances so many Within a small controller, there are so many logic gates and so many parameters that we can play around and control the system. It's immense. I mean, the capacity is huge. And that is where the world is going. So I I would like to, with that, I would like to add, uh, thank Mr. Kishore Kokar uh, for this wonderful session that we had. And it is basically just to give you an idea of what the marine automation is. So that you at least get some idea, open your mind, open your thoughts, and you ponder upon that, and then you try and dig more deep into it and trying to understand what a automation system is. So we, I would, I would like request all of you to give a good word of thanks to Mr. Kokwe uh, for this wonderful presentation. And with that, I would also like to thank. Uh, uh, our MC <clears throat> and uh, also uh, our esteemed sir uh, Gupta sir, he is, uh, I mean, his presence always uh, encourages us to do many things, you know. He's been a guiding light for us in uh, Institute of Marine Engineers, a very active member, and uh, and he's, he's just his presence, he really encourages us to do many uh, uh, to give uh, to do a lot of activities in Institute of Marine Engineers, which can benefit all the all you young engineers who are coming up in the uh, in your career. So we are always open. We are always open to suggestions. You can always reach out to us. And uh, I would like uh, I would like I'm really happy that he's here. And then uh, we thank him for his presence. So go play, sir, for his uh, for uh, yeah. taking this floor. Uh, and uh, taking this uh, presentation. And uh, I, I, at the same time, I, I want to thank all of you members, all of you guys who are present here for this uh, seminar, all the guys who are present online for this seminar, I would like to thank all of them for taking your time out and then you know, attending and trying to grasp what is coming forward. 
because I'm sure at least you'll, you must be having some key take, takeaway points from this, that how the automation system, where it is going forward and how uh, it, it is going to affect our life on board. And with that, again, I would like to thank uh, the Institute of Marine Engineers for this facility, uh, you know, providing us this facility for uh, this seminar. Uh, thanks one, once again. And uh, we have a high tea which has been arranged outside. I would like to request all of you uh, to join us for the high tea. Thank you once again. With that, I would like to conclude this seminar. Thank you all. Yeah, we talk to uh, director when he comes on Monday, and probably we put it on the notice board, but we'll confirm. Because maybe you can give him your phone number. I just stay here where I can drop in the middle of any time and check over there. That is not the Oh, it's phone number. Oh, it's a phone number. I'll just nine nine two zero six three zero. I'll give you a picture, and then you can take photographs. Yeah, that will be easy. That will be very easy. Okay. Easy, correct. Uh, yeah, you can put a ticket in the front. Yeah, you can see this no 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 five days is for management level 